Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Another Green Living Seminar presentation. Um, I'm Elena Traster in the Environmental Studies Department here at MCLA. This semester's Green Living Seminar is organized around the theme Capitalism and the Environment. All of these presentations are free and open to the public. They take place on Wednesdays at 5.30 here in the Feigenbaum Center for Science and Innovation, room 121. You can find the schedule and links to recordings of prior presentations at www.mcla.edu slash greenliving. Our presentation today again will last for about 45 minutes, uh, followed by a question and answer session. So remember those questions. Before I um, turn it over to our speaker tonight, I just want to make a quick announcement about next week's presentation. We hope you'll come back and join us next week, Wednesday, March 29th. We'll have Jennifer Hashley, the director of the New Entry Sustainable Farming Project, giving a lecture titled Economics of Climate Smart Agriculture. Today's presentation, titled Forest Carbon Offsets, Too Good to be True, will be presented by Dr. Charles Canham. He's a senior scientist emeritus uh, with the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies. Thanks so much for joining us again uh, tonight, Charlie. We're really glad to have you here. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Elena. I'm, I'm sorry I can't be there in person. It's much more fun to do these uh, with real faces in front of me instead of talking to my computer screen, but this uh, just worked better uh, tonight. So I'm going to talk about forest carbon offsets and, and, um, uh, and the controversy surrounding them. Um, and before getting into the controversies per se, I just want to talk a little bit and just take a minute to explain what an offset is and, and, and to do that in the context of, of the global carbon cycle and the literally thousands of science, Earth system scientists who have spent decades trying to put the numbers on this graph. The, the paper this comes from has probably 100 authors. Um, and uh, it's the estimate of the global carbon budget in 2021. Um, and, and the point I want to make here is that um, that sort of bluish gray bar over on the left is the estimate of the total emissions of, of carbon, in the form of carbon, to the atmosphere from uh, yeah, basically human use of fossil fuels, about nine and a half gigatons or billion metric tons uh, per year released to the atmosphere. Um, but only half of that actually stays in the atmosphere because between the oceans and terrestrial ecosystems, almost exactly half of it uh, is taken back out of the atmosphere every year through natural processes. So CO2 dissolves into the ocean and then sinks to the ocean floor. It's a form of storage. Um, on land, it's a net uh, uh, sink of about two gigatons or two billion uh, metric tons of carbon because there's both uptake in forests primarily, um, but also loss from deforestation and land use change in many parts of the world, particularly the tropics. And so that is an offset, and it's a vitally important offset. Uh, without it, um, atmospheric CO2 would be rising twice as fast. Um, so what's the U.S. contribution to this global carbon sink? Um, luckily, in the U.S., we have an extraordinary resource in the National Forest Inventory conducted um, e each year by the U.S. Forest Service as part of their Forest Inventory and Analysis Program. Uh, this is a program that's been in existence for over 80 years, but for the last 20 years, uh, the Forest Service uh, systematized and regularized the sampling so that some plots are sampled every year. Uh, there are about 100,000 forest plots in the eastern U.S., for instance, um, and about 20,000 of them are sampled every year. So uh, this is a uh, just a simple figure from Grant Domkey is at uh, U.S. Forest Service is in charge of compiling the numbers to meet our uh, Kyoto Protocol uh, carbon reporting numbers that, that all the signatories of that agreement uh, report each year. And it gives the net flux of CO2 and CO2 equivalents. And, um, uh, and I'll explain, basically, to, to do uh, greenhouse gas accounting, you have to account for the fact that CO2 is not the only global warming gas, nitrous oxides, methane also, and, and they have different warming potentials. So they represent different amounts of CO2 equivalents. But this is primarily due to CO2 uptake and release in the case of forests. 
And, and forest land in the US, um, almost 700 million acres of it in 2018, the most recent numbers, sequestered um, basically half a billion uh, metric tons um, of CO2 uh, in 2018, a very low average rate of sequestration. Um, but forest land was not the only source. There's also sequestration in urban trees, and there's also storage in harvested wood products. So when timber is harvested from a stand, some of it ends up in furniture. In the in the you know in the furniture, you're well, you're probably sitting on plastic chairs, but the tables may have some wood in them, um, and it also ends up in landfills, and that's a form of storage. And then there's each year there's a churn, a turnover, both uh, deforestation and which is slightly larger than afforestation or new forest created. The point I wanna make here is that, that the US um, is responsible, uh, the US forests uh, contribute about 10% of that total global terrestrial carbon sink. So they're enormously important. And these carbon, uh, this carbon sequestration, EPA estimates that it offsets about 11% of total US greenhouse gas emissions annually. So it's an enormously important um, benefit from U.S. forests. Um, but forest sequestration varies really widely across the U.S. This is also from Grant's, uh, Grant Domke's report. And um, I've circled in red the states in the Rocky Mountain region. Um, every one of those eight states is a net source of carbon to the atmosphere, not a sink. And um, raise your hands if you know why that is. Um, what do you read about, about forests in the West? It's fires. Um, it's also the combined effects of mountain pine beetle, um, which devastated millions of acres of lodgepole pine in the last decade. Um, the, the Pacific Coast states, California, Oregon, and Washington, they, they're actually, they have lots, they have large stocks of carbon and reasonably high rates of carbon sequestration or addition to those stocks each year. But these are numbers from 2018 and don't reflect um, the recent dramatic fires that have swept through forests in those states. So it, it's really the eastern states that are the um, uh, the eastern 31 states uh, represent 85 percent of the total forest carbon sequestration in eastern forests, and particularly the states down south, where you've got fast-growing tree species in a really favorable, warm, and wet climate uh, that store the most carbon. Um, but can we expect more from the forests? And, and I'm not gonna, I, you know, I can't do this talk without at least mentioning this notion of natural climate solutions. That term is everywhere these days. And it came about as a very clever bit of marketing by conservation organizations, particularly the Nature Conservancy, who I think were tired of being seen as simply raising alarm about the dire impacts of climate change on natural ecosystems and wanted to show that conservation and protecting natural ecosystems could instead be an important component of dealing with the climate crisis. Um, and so this is from a paper by Joe Fargione and a, a large number of other authors. Joe is a, a senior scientist with TNC, and it, and it does a calculation of what these, quote, natural climate solutions could be given market forces um, as the value of carbon offsets increases in the US. Um, and I have to say this analysis is academic in both the best and worst senses of the word. It's basically a really elaborate set of back of the envelope calculations uh, done entirely divorced from any practical considerations. Uh, the methods are buried um, really deeply in very technical appendices that no one appears to read, uh, certainly not the journalists who write glowing articles about the possibilities or the policymakers who buy into this story. So for instance, the, the second bar from the top there is called natural forest management. Uh, what this really means is what would happen if as the value of carbon offsets goes up to 50 or even $100, it's currently about $10, uh, what kinds of additional forest carbon sequestration might you achieve? And it's a big number. It's an almost 40% increase over current rates. But then you have to read the appendices to find out how they get that. And they do that by assuming that all logging would halt for 25 years on over 300 million acres of private forest land in the US, 44% of the nation's total forest land, and basically every acre of private forest land in the East. 
Um, but since we need forest products, they then assumed that we would plant 17 million acres of new forest plantations of fast growing pines and also thin fire prone forests in the West to make up the shortfall. Um, you know, this is, um, this is preposterous. Um, I, and I think these papers have done a real disservice in addressing the climate crisis by creating wildly unrealistic expectations among the, among the public and policymakers that there are cheap and painless ways to address the crisis. Um, but I do wanna talk just a, a bit more about background and, and the, the current and potential role of Eastern forests in climate mitigation. As I said, you know, the Eastern states are where all the action is. They're, they represent 50% of all the forest land uh, in the US, actually 51% as of 2018, but contributed 83% of the net se uh, sequestration from US forests. And, and, and this alone, just the Eastern forests alone are a globally significant uh, terrestrial carbon sink representing 7% of the estimated total global terrestrial carbon sink. So what does this look like in, 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 uh, to a scientist like me? And, and this is what it looks like. It looks like a strong, steady increase over time in the biomass of live trees and forests. And, and that's where 80% of the carbon sequestration is. There's a, a small amount is stored in the soils. There's a small amount is stored in dead wood in the forest. And a small amount is stored in the harvested wood products, including landfills. But live trees are where the action is. And the fact that uh, the average biomass of a forest in the Eastern US is steadily increasing at, at pretty much a remarkably linear rate is, is the pattern of carbon sequestration. The numbers in the legend are actually the slopes of those lines. And so that's an estimate of how much biomass is increasing each year across the last almost 20 years in, uh, in Eastern forests. And this is based on sampling of those almost 100,000 plots uh, in the US with about 20,000 sampled in any given year. So the, the other um, component of the, mag <coughs> excuse me, the magnitude of the Eastern forest carbon sink <laughs> is changes in forest land. And uh, you know the graphs on, on the left uh, really exaggerate the scale. If you look in the lower right panel, the 31 Eastern states, um, forest land over the last uh, previous decade here, you know, varied between 148 and 149 million hectares, or you know, 360 to 362 uh, million acres. Um, but it, you know, different parts of the East have shown very different trends, and and what creates those trends is in the panels on the right, and and those are the um, the green lines are the acreage of um, non-forest land that is converted to forest land in any given year. Um, and the red lines are the land, forest lands lost to non-forest conditions. About half of that is to development for, um, you know, residential and uh, commercial uh, clearing of land for development. Um, it, that development, those rates of development vary uh, widely among region. They're particularly high in the deep south where population is growing uh, so strongly. But you'll notice that all of those green lines are declining. And um, basically, the lands that are being converted from non-forest to forest are not really the product of uh, people going out and very deliberately replanting forests um, or planting forests on former agricultural land, for instance. What that really is, is the legacy of, of the 100-year history of land abandonment from agriculture, old field succession, and gradual reforestation of the eastern landscape. Um, you know, 70 years, you know, right now the, the eastern forest landscape is almost exactly 50% forested, um, but 50, 60, 70 years ago, it was only 20% forested. And as, as agriculture has waned, forests have regrown and they've done that on their own. This is not something that um, uh, humans could take credit for except by walking away from their farms. Um, so what are the options to increase U.S. forest carbon sequestration? Well, there, there are two really diametrically opposed um, alternatives. Uh, the most widely touted has been given the term proforestation, and this is simply the proposal to halt logging on the lands in question. Uh, it's being actively promoted 
for not just climate mitigation, but because of the many ecological and social benefits of intact unmanaged forests. Um, now logging's legally prohibited on probably less than 10% <laughs> and closer to five, only 5% 5 of Eastern forest land. And I fully support efforts to set aside and protect and reserve more land. Uh, but when you read this paper or listen to folks talk about proforestation, you get the very clear impression that they would happily ban logging on all lands. And that clearly ignores the very serious <coughs> excuse me, economic and ecological impacts of reducing domestic production of forest products. So for instance, the US has only a small fraction of the paper mills we once had. Uh, that's been great for air quality in the communities that were once next door to those mills and has certainly reduced demand for pulp domestically. But we basically just offshored our demand for paper and sent it uh, to the tropics, resulting in devastating consequences as those tropical forests were, were cleared and planted to uh, plantations of exotic tree species. Um, the alternative approach is, is one is re represented by a new program from the American Forest Foundation and the Nature Conservancy called the Family Forest Carbon Program. Uh, this is a very complicated initiative, uh, but at its heart, it's uh, based on the assumption that careful silviculture, so more active logging, that increases rates of logging can not just improve forest health, but can also increase carbon sequestration. And I have to say that assumption is, is highly questionable. The default would be that, no, that's just not likely to be true, in fact. Um, when a forester talks about improving forest health, what they <coughs> generally really mean is they're going to increase the number and growth rates of the most valuable uh, timber trees. And the way they typically do that is to thin out low grade or less valuable trees. And when done properly, this does indeed increase the growth rates of the trees left behind. Uh, but the forest as a whole stores less carbon simply because there are fewer trees growing. It, it's actually really easy to show from the forest inventory data that overall forest productivity is lower follow even a, uh, following even a carefully designed partial harvest uh, for at least the next decade or so. And even when the canopy closes, growth rates typically simply only recover to the rates they were before the harvest. Now, I've spent years researching the nature of competition among forest trees. I think I talked about this work when I last spoke at MCLA. Um, and that, that work suggests that very careful and deliberate silviculture and management over many years could assemble an ideal mix of the spacing and sizes of different species of trees that could conceivably result in a 10 to 20% increase in forest productivity. But this would take extraordinary effort and lots of time. Um, so, so I wish AFF and TNC luck. Uh, this is a noble effort, uh, but their website makes what I consider wildly unrealistic claims for the potential climate mitigation benefits. So that leads me to what I suspect you expected me to really talk about, and that's the emergence of this very active um, buying and selling of carbon credits on, at auction on carbon markets. Um, um, and <clears throat> so the rest of the talk will focus on what impact, if any, uh, this market uh, could have on the future of US forest carbon sequestration. So there are basically four parties in any forest carbon offset deal. The three obvious ones are the forest landowner who wants to sell the credits and, and get reimbursed for the benefits their forests are providing. Uh, the industry that wants to buy the credits rather than actually reduce their emissions. And we can talk about the ethics of that. And then the third party are the many companies that have sprung up to broker these deals, uh, collecting hefty commissions along the way. But the fourth and actually most important party in these deals is the registry uh, that establishes the protocols and procedures by which offset credits are calculated and recorded and verified. And most of my comments will be about the very serious structural flaws I see in the nature, whoops, sorry, in the nature of the uh, protocols established by the registries. I'll say at the outset that while the registries in principle should be serving as an independent and unbiased referee in this market, think of something like the Securities and Exchange Commission or generally accepted accounting practices. Um, 
but rather, but instead of that, the registries share exactly the same conflict of interest that the other three parties share, namely that a viable market only exists because the protocols lead to gross exaggeration of the marketable credits and revenue that far exceeds what could realistically be expected. And without that revenue, the market wouldn't exist and these registries would have no reason to exist. And as I'll try to explain in the next few minutes, the problems I see with the carbon markets are in fact a deliberate feature of the registry protocols. This is not a case that there is a bug being exploited by unscrupulous actors. So everybody in this space agrees that carbon credits should meet four key standards. And the most important is this notion of additionality. As I showed in those early slides, US forests, particularly forests in the East, are already sequestering carbon at, a, um, at an impressive and steady rate, at least here in the East. But the notion is that these carbon credits should only be sold if uh, something's being done to increase sequestration above what would happen under business as usual. Uh, the second principle that flows from this is that a credit is only additional if, if, if you stop logging your forest, but your neighbor picks up the slack and, and the loggers just go there and take the same amount of timber from your neighbor, then there's been no net benefit. And, and this is what the economists refer to as leakage, where reducing harvests on one property simply drives increased harvest elsewhere. Um, so there needs to be accounting for leakage. It turns out to be a very um, challenging issue for the economists to deal with. Uh, the, the third um, standard is this notion of permanence. Um, we can't just simply pay people to grow trees until they want to log them again. We have to pay people to store carbon that will stay in the forest uh, for some meaningful length of time. Um, it turns out there's a lot of debate about exactly what permanent means uh, in, in the registries. They just sort of cavalierly say permanent, the word permanent is uncertain and we'll pick 40 years, which is just not appropriate for my to my mind, but I'll get to that point. And the final one is, is um, sort of routine, um, but everyone agrees that the carbon credits need to be verified by a third party that will actually go out and make sure that uh, the credits that have been sold at auction have actually been stored. What's the problem? Uh, the problem that is in practice, um, the protocols on the registries don't just allow, but actually encourage deals that fail on those first three key criteria. So a little over two years ago, December of 2020, as a board member of a local land trust, I learned details of a carbon offset deal that TNC wanted to pursue with the land trust. Um, this was the first time I actually really learned and really, to be honest, paid attention to what was going on with these markets and it raised a lot of questions in my mind um, and whether the deal came even close to satisfying those, those key criteria. I sent an email to conservancy staff and scientists, but before they could meet with me to explain their approach and answer my questions, uh, Ben Elgin at Bloomberg News published what can only be called an expose showing that the concerns I had were present in most of the offset deals uh, the conservancy was pursuing. Um, at that time, TNC went into damage control mode they apparently did some sort of internal review, but have never released details of that review and have never reached out to me to discuss my concerns, even though I had been a volunteer trustee of a TNC chapter for over 25 years. Um, in frustration, eventually in May of 2021, I wrote up my concerns in a blog post on the Cary Institute website. Um, this offended TNC, I was promptly asked to resign from the chapter board and I did so. So, I need to sort of walk you through the problem in the protocols. And the problem is in um, the definition, this is sort of the original sin in the voluntary carbon markets. And it's the structural flaw that leads to gross exaggeration of true additional forest carbon sequestration. And, and, and it comes from um, essentially assuming that calculation of additionality has to be against a baseline, against, think of it as sort of, what would you expect if nothing was done? If there was no deal, how much carbon would be stored? 
Um, but unfortunately, rather than use the history of what's been done in the forest, past or current management, the protocols are kept, uh, generate a baseline on the assumption that all landowners manage their forest land to maximize net present value of the timber resource subject to a 4% discount rate. So if you're an economist, that makes sense. Um, but what this, um, if you're not, you have to think about this for a minute, but, but here's the bottom line. Eastern forests, if you think of, of that timber as a, as a resource, it only adds about 2% new biomass per year. It can increase in value more if, if that 2% is concentrated in really valuable saw logs, but even then it might only increase in value at three to 4% per year. If you apply a 4% discount rate and ask, what do I do to maximize the value of my timber resource? What the models will generate is a proposal to basically liquidate the timber and clear cut every acre that is accessible as fast as you can. And here's how this plays out in a specific deal. I, I don't mean to pick on the Albany Water Board. Um, it's a project uh, 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 that started in 2019 when the Nature Conservancy approached the Albany Water Board and proposed that they enter into a carbon deal on their roughly 4,000 acres of, of watershed lands around Albany. Um, and uh, the proposal to the Albany Water Board was that they could sell carbon credits, generate valuable revenue to the, uh, to the watershed district uh, without doing anything to change their use of the land. So the consultants took the information about those 4,000 acres and asked what logging would maximize net present value with a 4% discount rate, ignoring the explicit statements from the Albany Water Board that they had no intention of ever logging these lands. And so that black line is what the baseline, uh, is the baseline generated by that assumption of maximizing value. And it assumed that they would clear cut 90% of the watershed in the first 10 years. And under that baseline, the credits that can be sold are the difference between that black line and the blue line, which is what they projected would happen under, um, under quote, the project in which the forest continued to be allowed to grow. Um, the bottom line is, you know, you, you get some gross credits and then the, the protocols reduce those credits to allow for leakage and, and, uh, and disturbance. But the bottom line is that this, uh, you know, by grossly exaggerating what would happen uh, in terms of clear cutting 90% of this, uh, the project sells credits for almost 200,000 tons over the first seven years. Um, but it's only that the annual increment in that blue line that represents even close to a truly additional um, carbon sequestration because that's what's currently happening on the land. So the bottom line is that 96% of the credits sold are due to this wildly unrealistic baseline calculation. And in fact, since the Albany Water Board said explicitly in the public documents that they had no intention of ever logging the land, there can be no truly additional um, carbon credits issued. So, um, you know, a, a, another example uh, that was recently posted on the, the uh, American Carbon Registry website, the University of Tennessee has a 10,000 acre research forest uh, near in, in uh, Eastern Tennessee. Um, they just posted a deal. Uh, this is, uh, these are very healthy, um, well-stocked oak hickory forests with a lot of carbon. Uh, the project assumes that they're gonna clear cut 85% of those forests in the next 10 years. And it's only 85% because the other 15% they can't legally cut because of stream buffer requirements. Um, the proposal is frankly obscene. There's absolutely no compelling reason to believe that UT had any intention of liquidating the forest. Um, and, you know, there's another, um, you know, in effect, th this, this method of calculating the baseline is, in, is essentially marketing the carbon that's been stored over the last hundred years so that industries can claim that they are offsetting future carbon emissions. You have to think about that for a minute to realize just how bizarre and wrong that is. It's, it's, the flaw is so glaring that I still shake my head when I think about it. So why do the registries not just allow but encourage such egregious exaggeration of expected additionality? Well, it's because if you don't, there's just no revenue. 
So uh, colleagues and I have uh, completed a really exhaustive analysis of the potential carbon sequestration for the four northern states from New York to Maine. This is uh, uh, part of part of this is uh, uh, work that Michelle Brown has just finished uh, for her PhD at the University of Vermont. Um, and when we look at the forests and their current um, harvest practices, the mix of forests all across that region, um, our estimate of the average sequestration over the next 50 years is 1.7 tons CO2 equivalent per acre. We ran a, 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 a scenario in which all logging was halted in the region. Um, that only results in about a 35% increase in sequestration because frankly, logging rates are not that high in the Northeast. Um, so that's the you know, half a ton of potential additional sequestration. But if you use subtract the 40% leakage estimate that's standard and a 15% set aside to account for disturbances like hemlock woolly adelgid and emerald ash borer and, and uh, drought and fire and so forth, you, know, you, you end up um, getting an estimate of, of, of around a quarter of a ton. And at $15 a ton, which is actually above what these credits are selling for in the current market, and assuming you have to pay the brokerage fee to your broker, and there's also an annual compliance cost that's not insignificant. At the current prices, an accurate assessment of truly additional carbon sequestration, the landowner would lose money. It would cost him a dollar an acre per year. Only when carbon offset prices get above $20 a ton would they break even and only begin to start to make any meaningful money at $50 a ton. And so this, this is basically, um, you know, I, I've, I'm convinced that uh, when the people were setting up the protocols for these markets, they knew these numbers and they realized that under these numbers, no landowner is going to sign a contract that commits them to 100 years of compliance costs uh, when they're only getting a dollar an acre uh, per year. So this is fundamentally what's known to an economist as an adverse selection problem. Um, the, the only landowners willing to pursue a carbon deal are exactly the landowners who had no even remotely plausible likelihood of pursuing the aggressive liquidation of their timber. If they did aggressively liquidate, they would make probably five times as much money from the timber receipts than they would from the carbon offsets. Um, and they're only willing to do the deal under the gross exaggeration of the actual additional carbon offset. Now, there certainly are um, corporate landowners, uh, mostly the timber investment management organizations and the, and the real estate investment trusts, um, who are aggressively harvesting. But even they're not harvesting in a way that would liquidate the timber resource in a short time span. And because of that, even those companies, like Lime Timber, can create a hypothetical baseline that is way below what they're actually managing to and generate what the Lime CEO freely acknowledged in a, another, uh, another uh, Ben Elgin uh, interview uh, piece in Bloomberg News about a year ago, uh, freely acknowledges are useless, um, basically phantom carbon credits. Um, this was a really a bombshell. So this is, you know, the CEO of, of one of the largest land forest landowners in the Northeast and, and in the East saying, look, we've been getting a lot of money from these things, but they're false. They're not real credits. Um, and uh, he actually estimated that timber offset prices would need to get above $60 a ton before they would actually truly change their management. I don't have time to go into this, but this becomes not an adverse selection problem, but then a perverse incentive problem. And at some point as offset prices rise, um, there's the potential very for very perverse impacts on the way we manage forests. I just I, that's a whole separate seminar, and I won't. I'm going to try to resist getting into it. But this is how this how this looks in uh, in my home state of New York, and particularly in the Adirondacks, where I've worked for so many years. These are numbers. It's a complicated table. I just want you to look first at the column on the far right. The, this is sequestration. It's actually in the. The, 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 the numbers that foresters care about are volume of wood because that's what they get paid for and ends up as saw logs and so forth. So these are units of cubic feet of wood per acre per year, dry weight. 
But what I want you to compare is that number 6.9 for Adirondack private forest land. Now these are these are where all the big corporate forest lands are in the in the uh, in New York. These are the former lands of companies like Champion and International Paper and Finch Prime, Domtar. Um, all of these lands were divested from those mill companies and sold to uh, timber investment firms over the last 20 years. Um, but compare the rates of sequestration there with the rates in e outside of the Adirondacks in Eastern New York or Western New York, where, where rates are four to five times higher. And why is that? Well, growth rates are, are higher. That's that gross growth column. Um, the soils are a little better and the climate's a little better. But the real difference is just this removals column. That's the estimate of how much is, is logged and removed. And if removals um, uh, begin to equal net growth, then you have um, no real in increment, no real sequestration happen. And it's that net growth to removals ratio that the forest industry uses to assess <coughs> whether the forest stock is increasing or decreasing. If that number gets down to one, then there's no increase in forest carbon. Um, the um, uh, you know the the forest preserve number is still dra dramatically lower than outside the park, and uh, that's that's for two reasons: both growth and mortality. Growth is low and mortality is high, and that's because of the effects of beech bark disease. Beech is the dominant species in the Adirondacks, and beech bark disease has been present for fifty years and continues. Uh, to hammer those forests. Um, if we could invest the money to find a biological control for beech bark disease, uh, those forests would rapidly become a dramatic uh, carbon sink. Another way to look at the adverse selection problem is to think about who owns eastern forests. Um, only 25% of eastern forest land is publicly owned, um, and half, fully half of all um, Eastern forest land is owned by families, into private individuals. <coughs> and the uh, U.S. Forest Service does a, a, a marvelous survey of forest land owners about their management goals through what's known as the National Woodland Owner Survey run out of the University of Massachusetts and Brett Butler uh, with the Forest Service. And one of the most consistent findings from that work is that economic return um, is really low on the list of reasons that families own forest land. Conservation and recreation rank far higher. Um, and, and so the intensively managed, these primarily corporate ownerships, generate revenue from timber sales that's several times higher than even grossly exaggerated carbon offsets would, would provide. And so the landowners who are truly managing for return on investment from their land are thus the least likely to abandon those returns for much smaller returns from the sale of offsets. So what about the other criteria for evaluating carbon offsets? Um, you know, the second one I mentioned was this issue of leakage. This is really, this gets into wonky territory. Most of the literature on, on estimating what leakage would be is, is based on theoretical economic models because they're really hard to measure what would happen. Um, the registry protocols require a 40% reduction uh, for leakage. Uh, there are a lot of, of um, economic analyses that suggest that a true allowance would be closer to 80%, but it's really hard to know. Um, permanence, as I, as I think I mentioned before, um, in, a, in some language that I found extraordinarily cavalier, uh, the American Carbon Registry Protocol dodges this question by saying, philosophically, what is forever? 40 years seems like a good estimate. Um, the problem is that the average interval between successive logging in most Northeastern forests is not much longer than 40 years. And in, a, in the blog post I did two years ago, I, I laid out what I thought at the time was sort of a, a bizarre possibility for how you could gain the system by high grading your forest, sell all the valuable trees, but leave all the low grade stuff. Uh, there'd still be enough there that if you do that aggressive baseline, you could sell a, a very large amount of carbon credits while you waited for the 40 years it would take for the, you know, for high quality trees to grow back, then the deal would be over and you could just come in and log. And so basically we'd just be paying people to high grade their, 
their land and paying them to grow the trees that they were going to cut down the next time. At the time, I I I, I thought this that's too weird a thing to even put in the blog. It turns out that um, the people doing these deals are very savvy, and and it looks like um, companies have realized that that could be a very profitable practice. And there are new companies being formed to simply go out and buy what looked to be pretty marginal forest land, put a carbon deal on it, make a lot of money up front, and let the trees grow until they can be cut. Um, uh, the verification that that fourth criterion is is um, is is an issue that um, you know it, it can't be ignored. It's important. It's expensive. Um, but I have to think that actually costs are likely to come down. Things like remote sensing are going to improve um, the ability to actually detect weather uh, that's happening. But at the end of the day, it's that additionality uh, criterion and the um, the protocols for setting baselines that to me are the original sin in these protocols. But there are other issues um, that, that really need to be discussed. And pretty much everything I've discussed up to this point uh, could be thought of as arguments about accounting, methodology for calculating what is a truly additional forest carbon offsets. Um, but there's a really far more fundamental issue and one that could trump all of these arguments about correcting, fixing those protocols. So there's just overwhelming scientific evidence that air pollution disproportionately impacts disadvantaged communities and communities of color. Um, the papers are, uh, you know, the, the literature is growing every day on this. So even if the carbon market protocols out accurately calculated carbon offsets, that wouldn't address the fact that the industries buying those offsets would be doing so to allow plants like this to continue to emit those emissions in those in those communities. And so, for instance, this, this appears to be one of the reasons that reauthorization of the California compliance market in 2017 uh, began to reduce the role for offsets and limited the proportion of offsets that could be generated outside of the state. So, frankly, I, I'm just simply not a convinced that the accounting issues that I've raised are solvable, but even if the environmental justice, but if the environmental justice issues can't be resolved, then the accounting issues are moot as far as I'm concerned. Our forests can and will continue to provide critically important offsets to carbon emissions, but marketing those offsets to allow emitters to continue to pollute is simply unethical. A second issue that really never seems to get discussed is is a market mechanism the right way to allocate the crediting of existing forest carbon offsets against emissions? Now, in principle, if every emitter of CO2 had to pay, say, a carbon tax or, um, um, you know, essentially a carbon tax, then in principle, the industries that had the hardest time replacing their emissions, think of airplane fuels or cement plants, they'd be willing to pay the most uh, for offsets to account for their emissions. And that would drive the price up to a point where those offsets flowed to the most critical need. But that's not the way this market works. This, uh, the, these, these voluntary markets, these offsets are being bought up by Disney and, and uh, fossil fuel companies and just um, Google and Amazon. Uh, when there are already um, cost-effective ways to not offset their emissions, but eliminate their emissions by supporting the development of carbon neutral uh, energy sources. So I wanna wrap up with some thoughts on the likely future of the US and Eastern forest carbon sink. Um, and, and this is really the take home message folks. The forests of the Eastern US are a globally significant offset to the world's greenhouse gas emissions and are likely to remain so. But there are a whole lot of challenges these forests face. And rather than naively think that we're going to significantly expand those offsets, we're going to have to work hard to make sure we keep what we have. Um, there are all sorts of threats. Climate change, obviously. Fire in the West uh, seems intractable. It's, it's hard to imagine any uh, near-term changes in conditions that would lead those forests to shift from being sources of CO2 to sinks. Um, here in the East, we have the ongoing problem of pests and pathogens and an incurring, increasing problem with drought. Uh, 
And then there's the slow but steady loss of forest land to development. And, um, and finally, um, again, this, this would require whole seminars on their own, but there are very real limitations on what we might be able to expect from reforestation or proforestation. Whoops, sorry. And so, you know, I, I guess if the first one is sort of the, one, the, the key take home message, this is the other one. Um, despite all the money being made in these forest carbon offset markets, I see absolutely no way that those markets can change these dynamics. Um, the existing protocols vastly overestimate any potential increases in forest carbon sequestration. I, I've tried to be measured in my description of, of the flaws in these markets, um, but I have to say at one point I Googled the definition of fraud and the definition I found was deliberate misrepresentation for financial gain. Um, that seems like an entirely apt description of what's happening here. So I'll end there and I ran over a little bit, my apologies, and I'd be happy to take questions. Following on that grasslands, I know the proposal to keep harvesting the grass and keep the roots in the ground as being a significant sink. So you don't agree that that's a significant? Oh, so I, with respect to, to agriculture, um, maybe more uh, perennial um, types of plants with uh, uh, keeping roots in the ground. Is there some uh, feasibility for uh, climate benefits there? Well, a very small one, but there are enormous other benefits to things like no-till agriculture. And, and you know, many farmers are already moving that way for all sorts of other very good reasons um, and frankly, more compelling reasons. I don't know any uh, uh, soil carbon scientists who actually believe that changes in ag practices uh, can again lead to a significant increase in carbon sequestration in ag systems. There's an enormous, um, farmers are beloved. Uh, uh, nicest thing that's happened in my small town in the last 20 years was a small farm opening up down the road where we can get local produce and, and meat and eggs. Um, and so there are all sorts of programs to, to try to help support them. And any, you know, money, uh, you know, in the, in the vein of never letting a crisis go to waste, um, there are all sorts of marginal but potential climate benefits to changing um, farming practices and lots of money going into those programs. But again, um, relative to our greenhouse gas emissions, um, folks, this is just a drop in the bucket. Um, we know the answer to the climate crisis, folks. Um, going to no-till ag is not the answer. The answer is to decarbonize the energy industry. So I, I have a question. Um, since your talk was focused on the forests of the Northeast or the United States, um, what about international, what about tropical forests? Are there opportunities for um, reforestation or conservation that um, you think there's any merit to uh, offsets being involved there? Well, I, I think um, I think there is important potential um, in other parts of the world. The problem is um, verification um, and the uh, And, and I guess to me, the question is whether these voluntary carbon markets are the right way to encourage reductions in deforestation and degradation of tropical forests. And, and I'm just not convinced that they are. I, I think it's too easy for um, this system to be gamed. Um, you know, there are all sorts of ways to support communities to reduce the pressure they have on the land, particularly improvements in their agricultural practices so that they're they're not you know forced to clear and in, inefficiently use so much land but but the real threat in in the tropics is is frankly not um, you know local communities it's from the industrialization of um, you know it's palm oil and paper production that is clearing and then large-scale cattle ranching and things like that that are large industrial activities that are clearing millions of acres. And it's why the tropics are, by many estimates, a net source of CO2 to the atmosphere, not a sink, um, because of the extensive conversion and, and loss of tropical forests. 
Um, those businesses are making a ton of money, folks. And yes, they might be willing to do carbon offset deals. Would it mean that they would actually reduce the destruction they cause? I'm not at all convinced. I wonder if you're familiar with the uh, issue of uh, deforestation in some of our southern softwood uh, forests and the chipping up of that, uh, the, that those forests be sent to England to be uh, used in coal-fired power plants. Um, so your um, uh, thoughts on deforestation of some of our southern uh, softwood species and uh, their uh, chipping and export uh, to England for use in some of their power plants? Yeah, so this has been a, um, a remark, you know, a remarkable story in many ways. Um, because of the way, because of some de decisions by the EU to arbitrarily treat all forest biomass as carbon neutral, something that is just frankly not true. Um, I spent many years working on a technical advisory team with EPA trying to figure out how to come up with calculations of the actual carbon consequences of biomass energy production. It is not inherently carbon neutral. And it's def definitely not carbon neutral if the extraction of that forest uh, 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 biomass feedstock leads to reductions in the stock of carbon on the landscape. And there's a very recent paper that um, essentially tries to show that, so, so the, the explosion, um, the growth in this pellet production in the Southeast is extraordinary. There, there are whole ports being built to handle the shipping of millions of tons of pellets to England to co-fire with their coal plants. Um, it has it has dramatically changed harvests in southern pine forest, dramatically increased harvests. And so within the 50 mile or so radius around these mill pellet plants, logging has increased dramatically. And this recent paper, in a very complicated analysis, tries comes to the conclusion that there's just not, it's not truly depleting carbon stocks but almost certainly it's reducing carbon stocks relative to what would have happened in the absence of those plants. And so most people would argue that that is not carbon neutral. Um, I would certainly argue that. And actually colleagues and I are trying to think about how to um, uh, take a different approach and, and see if we can come up with a, a, a clearer analysis. But there's no question that this is a major transformation in Southeastern forestry and a major intensification of forestry uh, that is almost certainly reducing carbon stocks within the vicinities of the roughly 30 large pellet mills that have now been built in the Southeast. I've got another question. We'll see if there, there may be time for one more. Um, or, uh, so I'm, I'm curious, um, is there any thoughts as to the trajectory of those Rocky Mountain forests, how long they'll continue to be um, carbon sources rather than carbon sinks? Is there any, um, uh, any hope that that will slow down and or reverse? Well, <clears throat> uh, actually, my, uh, my colleague uh, Winslow Hansen here at the Cary Institute is leading a very large effort to try to understand what's driving it and what those changes might be. You know, the, the, the Rockies are warming up faster than almost all other parts of the <laughs> continental US. Um, you know, we've seen the impacts of drought. This, this winter was, was sort of a, a welcome relief from drought. Um, but the fire problem in the West is the accumulation of, of fuel and changes in forest management that have happened over almost a century. And, I, you know, I think it's, um, I don't want to, I, I don't want to guess what the outcome of all that research will be. I, I would have to say, I suspect that none of the people working in those forests expect the problem to get better before it gets worse. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is essentially a race against time with climate change. As climate change dries out, and warms up those regions, the fires are just gonna get worse and worse. Um, 
And so the question is, can we slow the rate of climate change fast enough to allow us to get ahead of the fires? All right, looking around in case there's any last questions before we wrap it up for this evening. And I think um, that uh, we will be wrapping it up. So I'd like to say thank you again, Charlie. We really appreciate your sharing your, your expertise with us uh, tonight. And um, hopefully that will lead to some better uh, informed decision making, um, your work on carbon offsets. Um, and decisions that come ahead. Thanks to all of you for coming tonight. Please join us again next week when we will be thinking about climate smart agriculture and uh, the status of uh, efforts in that arena. Um, thank you all. Good night, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to talk, Elena.